Yes, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, Arts and Humanities class, half a survey, whatever you want to call it. Uh, <clears throat> um, sorry, I'm coming at you late today. I hope that doesn't inconvenience in many of you. Yes, I'm wearing an old Cubcat sweatshirt. I'm digging at the bottom of my uh, laundry hamper. Uh, but yes, um, I hope that you all took time to look on Canvas under Assignments and find uh, my two, uh, actually three, three videos that I sent you today. Uh, you know, my favorite uh, piece of classical music is the William Tell Overture by Giovanni Rossini, uh, you know, that you all know as the Lone Ranger. And... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I was always so disappointed to see that Hollywood couldn't take this wonderful piece of Americana, wonderful piece of romantic, dashing type literature and convert it into something that I think would be more representative of the genre. I mean, the Lone Ranger, <clears throat> you know, uh, a young Texas ranger by the name of John Reed who gets gunned down and, uh, by Butch Cavendish and his gang and um, then is nursed to health by a faithful Native American by the name of Tonto. Uh, and then he uh, dons the mask and goes around righting wrongs and bringing justice and riding that white horse. I mean, can you get any more uh, romantic than riding a, a white horse? You know, a pale white horse is supposed to, in the in Revelations, represent the bringing of justice. Uh, you know, and of course, as you, the other uh, metaphors, silver, not only the name of the horse, but he uses silver bullets in his revolver, and he's a dead shot. Uh, you know, I mean, and Hollywood has taken that and, you know, just really dropped the ball. I don't understand why they couldn't do with the Lone Ranger what they did with Batman, at least the second version of Batman. The 1980s version of Batman was with Michael Keaton was and George Clooney and Val Kilmer and was horrible. Uh, but, you know, the other superhero uh, things, uh, I don't understand why they couldn't do that. It's because it's a good story of good so-called American virtues of bravery, of fair play, of justice. You know, and then, and of course, of course, there has always been, I mean, that's been one constant throughout all versions of The Lone Ranger has been the William Tell Overture. Uh, that song, um, which is one of the wonderful things about classical music. Now, I hope that I'm thinking that, you know, it may be confusing to a lot of you that, you know, in all of my emails, all of my communications with you through uh, Canvas, all I do is show you videos of classical music. Uh, and then <laughs> we haven't even really talked about classical music in our study guide. Well, classical music was the art form that originated, the musical art form that originated during the Enlightenment period. And, uh, you know, you, I, you can't, <clears throat> if you like music at all, and you don't have to like classical music, I'm not telling you, but if you like music at all, you have to pay homage, you have to res pay respect to the originals. And no, classical music wasn't the first music ever made. But when music began to be recorded, began to be written down, to be played from one generation to the next, <clears throat> um, classical music was the first kind. And so the great artists of classical music, uh, you know, they are immortal. Loaded up with, <clears throat> loaded up with uh, Coke Zero today, so I'm jacked. 
Uh, and so, yeah, um, tomorrow I will introduce you to another. We haven't, for one thing, we have not even finished uh, talking about Mozart. Uh, your hero and mine. Well, at least my hero. But anyway, let's get back to, and let's spend a short time talking about the Enlightenment period. I hope you noticed that, just like I mentioned on Canvas, that our test, which was going to be tomorrow, I bumped it back until Tuesday because I didn't think we would get through this unit uh, in a week. But, you know, we bumped it back to Tuesday. And you know what? If we don't cover the material, if you guys ask lots of questions, which I just hear them all over the place, um, we will uh, bump it back some more. It all depends. I mean, it's amazing with how close we are to the end of the year, is it not? Yeah. All right. So let's talk about ballet. Roman numeral six in your study guide. I hope that you have your study guide in front of you uh, there from uh, Archie Mandy's uh, Unit 10, The Enlightenment. And we're going to talk about the... Uh, the art form, the dance art form of ballet. Once again, ballet was an invention of the Italians. But when people think of ballet today, I'm at home, I can scratch my face. When people think about ballet today, they talk and think about um, French ballet. Now, almost as a... As, uh, famous as French ballet, is Russian ballet, but that will come later on. Russian ballet includes even more athleticism. The French were the, as it says there, they uh, were the first to introduce the more athletic aspects of ballet. So once again, the French did not invent ballet, but they perfected it. Uh, <coughs> Perfected it, meaning that, you know, me, I've never, I actually went to one performance of ballet, Swan Lake, Peter Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, not Swan Lake, The Nutcracker, I'm sorry, uh, The Nutcracker, I saw that. Uh, I actually drove a bus, so a bunch of grade schoolers could go see it, and since I was the bus driver, they got me in there, and that was okay. But the French uh, were the first to introduce, uh, for example, the very difficult um, athletic maneuvers of ballet, such as standing on point. Imagine this is your foot, and you stand like this, and this is the tips of your toes. Now, yes, they do have a little square point of shoe, but that shoe doesn't support the entire weight. It takes tremendous strength physical control to be able to do that. I have always said, once again, that the best athletes in the world are dancers, and the best athletes of the dancers are the ballet dancers. You know, the things they're able to do. It's one reason why you don't find any ballet dancers who are over 30. It wears them out, uh, the, uh, the art form. So, uh, yes, the French did not invent ballet, but they perfected it. The French were the first to allow women to fully participate in theatrical dance theater. But the Italians wouldn't let women. Uh, they didn't think it was suitable for women to wear the outfits of ballet and then, you know, uh, expose themselves like that. But the French said, oh, we don't care. And yeah. All right. Roman rule seven. The German culture, the first time we're in all of, you know, in all of the uh, arts and humanities this year, we've talked about German culture, began to become the centerpiece of the new artistic movements of the Enlightenment period. Remember that German culture actually envelops about one third of Europe. In fact, uh, and I always tell my AP students this, that in uh, Europe today, more people speak German at their breakfast tables, meaning it's their first language, than any other language, which might surprise you. Although English is everybody's second language in Europe, uh, you know, one day when this coronavirus is over and you guys get to travel again, 
And, you know, and I know you may or may not want to do that uh, travel, but I really think you should. And you travel to Europe, um, don't worry about the language barrier because English is everybody's second language and all the signs are written. Top, at the top they're written in the native language, just under it written in English. And so it's really easy getting around for Yankees like us. So anyway, uh, remember that German culture envelops about one third of Europe encompassing what we now think of Germany or Prussia at the time, Austria and its empire, and all the many independent German states and principalities. And there were lots of them in what we now think of Germany, some of which were no bigger than Boone, Kenton, or Campbell counties. Literally, I mean, these principalities were independent countries and they were about the size of Boone, Kenton, and Campbell County put together. Uh, and were counted as fully independent countries. The Prussian Emperor Frederick the Great prided himself on being an enlightened despot. Good word, enlightened despot. What does that mean? Literally, the word enlightened despot uh, means smart king. For example, Louis XIV considered himself an enlightened despot. Why? Because he performed in the ballet. I don't know how good he was. And even if he's terrible, no one's going to tell him he's terrible. But, you know, that is an act of an enlightened despot to actually go and perform uh, in an art form. Uh, Joseph II of Austria is the best uh, example, I think, of an enlightened despot because Joseph II, uh, he was called the musical king. He loved music so much. He was a constant student of music. He learned how to play instruments. Uh, in fact, if you watch that film Amadeus, which is what we would do, we would be doing that uh, if we didn't have this. COVID-19. Um, but anyway, an enlightened despot, king that was, you know, he was with it. Hip, deaf, and jamming when it came to the newest scientific knowledge. In other words, he kept abreast of all these new ideas, the enlightenment. Uh, and he also kept the philosoph Voltaire as a paid advisor in his court. In the court of Frederick the Great of Prussia, the Frederick the Great, all kings had a council of advisors, council of advisors. And each of these advisors had a seat in the court. They got a salary. They got a residence. And Frederick the Great kept this French guy, Voltaire, as his paid advisor. German coffee houses took the place of the French salons as a home for scientific discussion and debate. The Rococo style of art and architecture, which we've already talked about, pastels, <coughs> general details, permeated the churches and the upper class homes of the French aristocracy. And yes, the enlightened emperor of Joseph II uh, was Mozart's most important employer, but not his first. Test question. Mozart's first employer was the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg. Say again. Mozart's first employer that he worked for and he got paid for was a church official, the Prince Archbishop of Mozart's hometown, which is Salzburg in Austria. But they fell out of favor, and then Mozart found himself freelancing. And yes, he worked some for Joseph II. He, Mozart, co was commissioned to write some operas, uh, such as his first opera, Escape from the Seraglio, which I'm going to send you by uh, by a canvas tomorrow. Yeah, by a canvas, uh, Escape from the Seraglio. I like that. Uh, by the way, the word seraglio, it's, uh, it's another word for a Turkish harem. But anyway, um, as we see in the film Amadeus, and I, like I said, we, I've sent you pieces of it already. I'm going to send you more pieces of it. Mozart, uh, theater performance and music were often loaded with political overtones. And see, that's interesting. Yeah, um, Musical performances took on political um, 
weight, political drama, political meaning. Uh, and Mozart actually got into trouble uh, for producing. Uh, the one he got in trouble for producing was uh, The Marriage of Figaro. The marriage, he got in trouble for producing The Marriage of Figaro um, because The Marriage of Figaro was a play, which, by the way, is on your test as well. And you're writing The Marriage of Figaro was, once again, a Spanish play. It was written about a Spanish noble family. It was written in Italian by a German, that German being Mozart. But it was a play about uh, lower class people you know, making fun of and showing up the nobility, which is why it was banned in Austria. And it was French. So the Enlightened Emperor, uh, rather, uh, the ballet um, that was in that play, Marriage of Figaro, was banned for a time in Austria because ballet, once again, was thought to be of French origin and therefore... Having been of French origin, Austria at the time was at war with France. And oh yes, notice it asked the question there, who was Emperor Joseph II's most famous sister? Emperor Joseph II, the son of Marie de Medici, had a little sister, her name, Marie Antoinette. And if you know anything about your history, World Civ, uh, you know that Marie Antoinette was the wife of the French Emperor Louis the Sixteenth, not the Fourteenth or the Fifteenth, the Sixteenth. And if you know, Louis the Sixteenth was beheaded, and several weeks later, so was Marie Antoinette. But yes, that was the Emperor Joseph II's most famous sister. Musicians and composers, on the other hand, were not paid nearly or appreciated nearly so much as they are now. You know, I mean, remember again, Mozart died in poverty. And he died, I think, around the age of 33 or something like that, 32, 33. And he died, he was so poor that when they buried him, he was buried actually much like they're burying people in New York right now. They, they're in a mass grave, an unmarked grave. Now they, in New York, they of course have the names of who's in there. When Mozart, if you were to go to Vienna looking for the grave of Mozart, you wouldn't find it. Because, you know, when Mozart was interred, when he was buried in the ground, they just dug this giant pit in the ground and threw these bodies wrapped in a white shroud in there, dumped a bunch of lime on top of the bodies to absorb the bad odor, covered the thing up and went and dug another hole for the next bunch. And so Mozart, who was the greatest musician who ever lived, died in poverty. Uh, in fact, spent most of his life, married life in poverty. Of course, part of that was his fault. Uh, man, money just burned a hole in the guy's pocket. Uh, and he drank too much party too much, had sex with everything that moves, and eventually, what killed him at age 30, venereal disease, complications from venereal disease, taking medicine for venereal disease, alcohol abuse. So, which is not that uncommon, to be honest, uh, in famous people's lives, that, you know, they tune into the fact that they're famous, think that they're invincible, and in the end, it gets them. So, um, as it says there, musicians and composers, on the other hand, were not nearly so appreciated or rewarded for their labors. They were often treated as servants of the bishops and the wealthy people who, convent, who commissioned them. And look what it says there. Mozart's first employer, once again, was the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg. Okay. The Prince Archbishop of Salzburg. All right, 
Um, let us discuss Mozart, shall we? You know, I mean, God, uh, the creator, uh, whoever, uh, and I hate saying things like that, uh, but I mean, you know, I have to take into account that there are all sorts of people who listen to my lectures of all sorts of faiths, but um, somehow Mo, uh, Emma, uh, Mozart was created with a skill that just boggles the mind, a skill that most other people didn't have, and that was his ability to get music. I mean, to understand music, to uh, express music, to speak in music. Um, and yeah, if we, about this time, we would have started watching the film Amadeus. And uh, I have a whole study guide for the film. We're going to sit there and we're going to watch it. We're going to break it. It's a three hour film. We're going to sit there and we were going to watch the thing frame by frame. And, you know, I explain it. And I have fun with that. And I think that, you know, a film about a musician, no, it's not Gladiator. And nor is it even, uh, oh, brother, where art thou? But, I mean, it's it can be made interesting if you know what you're looking for. I mean, Amadeus, <clears throat> the film Amadeus, which is about Mozart, is a, you know, it's, it's historical fiction. Yes, there was a Mozart. Yes, there was a Salieri. Yes, there was an Emperor Joseph II. Uh, there were all the people in the film existed. Now, did they do all the things exactly in the order that the film suggests? No, probably not. Surely not. No, they didn't. Um, Salieri and Mozart, the two primary antagonists in the film, they did know each other, uh, but they weren't deadly enemies. Uh, but anyway, uh, but Mozart, he was just born with this incredible capability um, and this capability meant that for example um, he could hear music one time and he'd remember it always not only remember he could then play it perform it after hearing one time <clears throat> And to me, though, and I think I've talked about this before, Mozart's most amazing ability was the fact that, you know, when he went to create music, when he went to write music, not and not just music, to write entire operas. And once again, an opera is a play set to music with actors and with dancing and with choreography uh, that Mozart would write out this these operas, which was a major undertaking. And then he would make no erasure marks. He made, he wrote it in ink, one copy, no scratch offs, no erasures. And you know, his composition pages were clean. He wrote his first opera at the age of 12. Um, I'm trying to remember what that opera was. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't Escape from the Seraglio. It was. It was an opera about Orpheus going into the underworld. And yes, he could perform as well as compose. In fact, when Mozart was a child, his father took him all over Europe. Him and his sister. That's the thing. What's funny is. Some historians say that Mozart's sister was more gifted than he was. And so Mozart's father, Leopold, took Mozart and his older sister around Europe, and they performed as children for the crown heads of Europe, for the Pope in Rome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then his, as his sister began to get older, Leopold decided, you know, uh, this is no life for a woman that she should go find a husband. And so she, her musical career ended there. Mozart, however, became the primary focus then. And so, yeah, uh, that's when he got his job. Uh, yeah, uh, Mozart was the American pop idol. 
the pop star rock juggernaut of his day in a day when there weren't any. He was candle in the wind. Remember that? Now, now come on. And there'll be a question on that video I sent you, uh, Elton John singing Candle in the Wind. And Mozart was the candle in the wind of his day. Meaning that he lived life full tilt. And, you know, too much alcohol, too much. Now you say well, they didn't have drugs back then. Yes, they did. They had opium, laudanum. Uh, that, yeah, that Mozart used to, when he would get sick, he would use it to make him feel better. The problem with using laudanum is that, as you know, it's physically addictive. Uh, and anyway, and doing that, that's why he died at age 30-something. And that's why he died broke, too. So um, he was able, Mozart was able to sense what the crowd liked and what they could tolerate. Although in the film, Amadeus, it is suggested several times that Mozart's musical pieces were just too long. I mean, for example, um, The Marriage of Figaro is four hours long. Four. I like classical music. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could do that even if I understood the Italian they were singing. But anyway, <clears throat> um, his most popular monetary success was the Magic Flute, which was, and the Magic Flute, and please tell me you wrote, wrote this down, the Magic Flute was, look at the bottom there where it says, what's a penny opera? The Magic Flute was a penny opera. What's well, a penny opera? A penny opera was an opera specifically designed to appeal to the poor, to the common people, the people that didn't have the money to, you know, get dressed up and go to the fancy opera. They went to the penny opera. And penny operas were, you know, had a lot more of the popular songs of the day, had a lot more of the more vulgar themes in it, you know, that would appeal to the common people. Uh, and so the magic flute was, because it had a lot of fantastic things in it, you know, giant snakes and explosions and things of that nature. But yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna have to send you some of those pieces too via canvas. So yeah. Um, I'm inclined to knock music, which is the four Peters, remember? Four Peters. <laughs> Yes, and remember, uh, that's uh, Ina Klein and Ock music. Uh, yes, and then, of course, The Marriage of Figaro, which is probably Mozart's greatest well-known opera, uh, was a play that, because of its subject matter, and the subject matter was that the poor made fun of the rich, was banned in Austria by the emperor. As it says there, the play criticized uh, the nobility and demanded righteousness of all classes. Okay, he also created serious works as well for a serious audience. Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni was Mozart's darkest opera. It was an opera, a, a tragedy uh, about a soldier, a commander who had came back from the war and he, he was the only survivor of his group that he commanded. And he was haunted by the ghost of those men. And so, yeah, it's a dark opera. Idomeneo, King of Crete, that actually, that was his first opera. Idomeneo, King of Crete, that was his first opera. Abduction from the Seraglio, which is the one I'm going to send you uh, from the film Amadeus, and then Cosi Fantuti. Women are like that. Okay, I'm going to end here. We're at 30 minutes. And tomorrow, look for in Canvas. Look for um, some of the uh, works of Mozart uh, from Amadeus. And, uh, yeah. And uh, we'll continue this tomorrow with Roman numeral 9. Very good. Okay, bye for now. Have a great day. And I will see you tomorrow.